Good morning and welcome to Paula Memorial. We just have a few announcements about events going on in the life of the church. Just a reminder that Holy Week will soon be upon us as next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And we'd love to invite you to join us for our Easter worship. So on Monday, Thursday, we will be gathering in the sanctuary for Holy Communion at 7 p.m. On Good Friday, we will be having hot cross buns at 10 a.m. and doing the crosswalk at 10.30 with the worship service at 11. And then Easter Sunday, the worship will be at 10.30 a.m. Just a reminder, during the month of April, we'll be collecting for our friends at the Downtown Mission. Right now, they're in need of blankets, socks, and uh, coffee. So if you're able to donate any of those, it would be greatly appreciated. And now let us come before our God and let us pray. Praise to the Lord, the Father of our salvation. Praise to the Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Praise to the Lord who loves us so much. He gave us his only son. Heavenly Father, we gather our hearts before you this morning as we lift up to you our prayers of adoration as we remember and give thanks for all the good that has come into our life, because you love us with a love that is able to overcome death itself. So we ask that you would once again listen to your children praying. God of compassion, we praise you this morning for your faithfulness that you have shown to your people throughout the ages. As you have walked with them, healing their wounds, setting them free from slavery, and reminding them that they are called to be a light into the nation. So the world may come to know your everlasting love and grace. We praise you, Lord, for your forgiving nature. As time after time, your people fell short of what you asked of them, and yet you stayed faithful to them. As you sent your Holy Spirit to rest upon your chosen prophets, to give them the power they needed to set the stage for your coming Messiah, the one who would open wide the gates to our forever home. We praise you, Lord, for the good news that you are a God who keeps his promise. For when the time was right, you gave us your only son, Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, for the many ways he was able to break the social barriers so that all those who hungered for the word of God could be fed no matter their gender or social status, as all were welcome to sit at the feet of the Messiah. We praise you, mighty God, that Jesus loves us so much. He was willing to go as far as the cross and the grave for our sake, so that by his wounds we could be made whole, and with his resurrection we could be brought back to a fullness of life. We praise you, everlasting Father, for the wonders of the empty tomb. For we know that Jesus lives, and because he lives, so too shall all those who dare to confess in his holy name. We praise you, Lord, for the work of the Spirit in our lives, and the many ways your Spirit helps to prepare our hearts for the coming of Holy Week, and the wonderful things you have done for your people. For all these things and so much more, loving God, we joyfully lift up to you our prayers of adoration. And together we speak the words that Jesus taught us to say by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Our first scripture reading today comes to us from Psalm 126. When the Lord restores the fortune of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we were filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams of the Nevir. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Our second scripture reading comes today from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas of Issachot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was a a year's worth of wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and the keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Old Rugged Cross was written in 1913 by George Bennard. It is generally thought to be the most popular of all 20th century hymns. George Bennard was born in Ohio, but as a young boy, the family moved to Lucas, Iowa. Here, George made his personal acceptance of Christ as his savior. He entered the ranks of the Salvation Army at the age of 16 after the death of his father. Later, George was ordained by the Methodist Episcopal Church. For some time, he conducted revival services throughout Michigan and New York. One time, after returning to Michigan, he passed through a trying experience. This caused him to reflect seriously about the significance of the cross and what the Apostle Paul meant when he spoke of entering into the fellowship of Christ's suffering. As he thought about these things, George became convinced that the cross was more than a religious symbol, but rather the very heart of the gospel. George Bennard has left this account of the writing of the old rugged cross. The inspiration came to me one day in 1913 when I was staying in Albion, Michigan. I began to write the old rugged cross. I composed the melody first. The words that I first wrote were imperfect. The words of the finished hymn were put into my heart in answer to my own need. Shortly thereafter, it was introduced at special meetings in Michigan on June 7, 1913. The first occasion where it was heard outside of the church in Michigan was at the Chicago Evangelistic Institute. There, it was introduced before a large convention and soon it became extremely popular throughout the country. George spent the last few years of his life near Reed City, Michigan. Near his home stands a 12 foot high cross with the words, the old rugged cross, home of George Bernard, composer of this beloved hymn. Although it has been stated that we do not worship the cross, but rather the Christ of the cross, It is hard to think of the truth of Christ's atonement without a keen awareness of the cross 
in God's plan of redemption for us. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. What's your love language? Do any of you know what I mean when I ask this question? It doesn't mean what foreign language do you think sounds romantic but instead it's become a rather common question I ask of those who are about to get married. As each person has their own way or their own language to show that they love another person. This language has very little to do with the words that are spoken, such as giving a pet name to your beloved, but instead focuses on the way you share your love with your partner or the way in which you look forward to someone sharing their love with you. Take, for example, some people's love language is to do big things every once in a while, like a surprise party or buying the biggest gift they can afford to give to their partner, whereas another person's love language might be smaller things, a nice home-cooked dinner after a stressful day, picking up a book that they know their partner longs to read. These are two very different ways to show that you care for someone, but they both mean the same thing to the one receiving the gift, as they are signs that they are loved and respected. 
Now you might be wondering what any of this has to do with today's gospel reading. For as important as it might be to learn about our own love language, to help us grow in our, our own personal relationships, how does this knowledge help us to grow in our spiritual relationship with God and his people? And this is what we're called to focus on on this week's reading leading up to Holy Week. Because understanding the importance of the language of love is crucial to understanding today's gospel story about the anointing at Bethany. Because today's reading is all about how different people respond out of love to Jesus and what he has done for them. Often when we take the time to dive into this well-known Bible story, we're so focused on Mary and her reaction to Jesus, we often forget that there are other people in the room with him, and others responding to Jesus with their own offering of love. All the men gathered around the table to share a meal, but the meal didn't magically appear on the table. Instead, it was placed there lovingly by Martha. Each dish that she made was an offering to Jesus and his followers. And this is a love language that Martha spoke in. She shared her love with each piece of bread, each dish that went from her kitchen to her table. As her gift was hospitality, and she loved being able to share her meals. Many of us today share the same love language that Martha spoke in so long ago. As we offer up food and welcome to let people know that they have a special place in our hearts. Think for a moment about how many church events are made possible because members of our church are willing to show their love for the Lord and for Paulin by baking or preparing a congregational meal or giving of their time and talents to serve as hosts for such wonderful events. <coughs> Whereas Mary, Martha's sister, spoke in a very different language than Martha. For her, rather than sharing her love with Jesus by preparing him a meal, she instead sits at his feet and learns from him. In today's gospel story, Mary responds out of love to Jesus by offering up the greatest gift that she owns. She pours out an entire jar of expensive perfume to anoint Jesus' feet. Now, it's important to the story for me to point out that this wasn't just something you could pick up at the end of the street at any time. For this perfume was very expensive, and it was often given as a gift to a young woman once she was old enough to understand what it represented, as this perfume was meant to go with her her entire life. A little bit would be used when she got married, a bit when she went to dedicate her child at the temple. This perfume was meant to last her to the end of her days as the very last of it would be used to anoint her body for burial. And yet Mary was so moved by her love for Jesus that she poured out the entire bottle at, her feet, at his feet, crying as she remembered all that Jesus had done for her, from allowing her to sit at his feet to bringing her brother Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus was the center of Mary's life, and this is why she had to offer him all that she had without a second thought, pouring out the perfume over his feet. Her only regret was she had nothing more to offer to the man who saved her. Mary's love language was to give without ceasing, to give wholeheartedly and with joy in her heart for the one who forever changed her life. We have people in our congregation today who speak in the same language of love that Mary did so long ago, 
as they give abundantly and joyfully to the projects that speak to their hearts, as they support mission projects or updates to the church building, they joyfully give without care for what others may think. As they are more concerned about offering up their gifts to the Lord who saved them. In today's gospel story, we're shown two very different ways to respond to what God has done for us. And there are still countless other ways in which we're able to speak the language of love to our great creator. But this morning's gospel reading also reminds us of the challenges that can happen when people tend to speak in different languages of love. And unfortunately, this too happens in our church today. Because while Martha's love language was acceptable to all, as who would turn down a homemade meal, Mary's gift is called out by others around the table. John tells us that Judas spoke up against her gift because he thought the perfume should be sold so that he would have control over the money it could bring in. But it's easy to imagine others around the table raising up their voices against what they believe to be an offensive amount of perfume being poured out at Jesus' feet. Imagine for a moment what it would be like if someone today came in and poured out an entire bottle of some expensive French perfume on the communion table. But they did it as an act of worship. How would you feel? Would you be willing to accept it? Or would you be telling them they need to find another way to glorify the Lord as you open the windows and turn the fans on? And just for the record, I'm not encouraging anyone to do something quite that dramatic as a sign of worship to the Lord, as we have many people in the congregation who do have scent allergies, myself included. But this doesn't mean we shouldn't be ready to welcome and accept people who speak in such a powerful language of love as Mary did so long ago. Just because it may not be the same language that you or I may speak in. Because you might have noticed, Jesus accepts the offerings from both sisters. He partakes in the meal that Martha prepared. And he accepts Mary's gift, proclaiming that she has anointed his body for his coming passion. If both of these offerings of love are accepted by Jesus, then we as his beloved people should also seek to accept these different types of gifts in Jesus' name. For each and every one of us is a unique individual, created and beloved by our God. So it would make sense that each and every one of us would offer up something different to our Heavenly Father. For if our church is to truly function as the hands and feet of the Lord, we need an assortment of gifts and talents to empower us for the work ahead. And with this in mind, we should ready ourselves to accept the different ways that people will lay out their offerings at the feet of Jesus rather than trying to judge one against another, as all of these offerings are an act of love and gratitude to the one who loves us so much that he gave us his only son, who came to set us free from all that holds us captive. For out of love for us, Jesus came and lived among us, out of love for us, Jesus went to the cross and the grave. Out of love for us, Christ rose again to glory. And because Jesus did all of this for us, who are we to judge those who have come to join us and laying their gifts at the feet of Jesus? For we are all welcome to come to Christ. 
We are all welcomed at the table that our Lord prepares for us out of love. For when we come to gather to break bread together, we do it in the name of the one who came to unite us all under the banner of his love whether you're more like Mary or Martha, or if you speak in another language of love entirely, come knowing that you are welcomed, that you are forgiven, and that you are loved. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this humble offering. May you multiply it so it may serve your needs and prepare the way for your coming kingdom of heaven. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
now in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.